Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Kohler Group's expansion into China webinar series. A webinar series aimed at helping foreign investors with their market entry, their operation, and their expansion throughout the jurisdiction. In today's webinar, we will be looking at the pilot free trade zones in China. In order to attract foreign investors to the Chinese market, in times of slow economic growth, China is continuing to set up these pilot free trade zones, although now they wouldn't be called pilot anymore, but it's a good way to differentiate them compared to the other economic zones that exist, and they're expanding these throughout the country. In recent years, the government opened up four free trade zones, and in August 2016, it was declared that an additional seven would be implemented and opened. In today's webinar, we will be looking at what key sectors the Chinese government is looking to attract into these zones. We'll be looking at the advantages that are there for foreign investors that are looking to operate within these zones. And we're going to have an overview of what these free trade zones mean for foreign investors whether they suit every industry, what other practical issues should we be looking at when analyzing whether a zone is suitable for a company or not. Before we begin today's presentation, I would just like to make sure that you can hear me. So if you can, it would be wonderful if you could click the hand button in the control panel. That will allow me to know that the sound system is functioning. Now, as is typical with any webinar, we will have the occasional problem or technical difficulty with an instability with the internet line. If this does occur either on my end, please be patient and wait for either a few seconds or a few minutes until I come back. If it happens on your end, then my suggestion would be to switch your audio function from your computer function to a landline telephone. Now, as is typical with any of our webinars, we do like to promote a Q&A session. Please use this opportunity while you are here to ask any questions, insert any comments into the question section of the control panel. We might not have time for a Q&A at the end of this session, but I will certainly get back to each of you uh, at the end of the webinar. For those of you that are new, to Kohler Group, who we are. Please allow me to introduce ourselves. Kohler Group is a CSC company. We provide a wide range of services for foreign investors that are looking to enter three jurisdictions in the Asian market, primarily China, Hong Kong, and Singapore. We assist these clients with pre-investment consulting services, followed by the implementation of the actual strategy that is being developed and we offer an outsourcing solution of services once the company is incorporated. We have just over 120 employees located throughout the three jurisdictions. We have 10 operational offices, and we speak a variety of languages internally, being able to cater to the mother tongue of our clients. A little bit about myself. My name is Christina kohler Coluccia. I'm a director at Kohler Group, and I've been with the firm since 2003 when I first moved to Shanghai to open our first office. I've been assisting foreign investors with their market entry, expansion within the territory, and their operational needs uh, for the last 14 years in China. But since then, I've also been helping clients expand into the Asian region. I produce a variety of resources together with my colleagues within the firm in terms of journal articles, articles, alerts, webinars that are all free of charge. If you are interested in subscribing to our e-newsletter, which is sent out weekly, providing all of these free details, then please register on our homepage by simply inserting your email address into the section entitled China Invest.biz Information Series. Now, without further delays, let us begin with today's presentation. Looking at the so-called pilot free trade zones. Now, in retrospect, special economic zones, like the pilot free trade zones, are nothing new in China. 
The trend to develop these economic zones first started back in the 1980s when China slowly began to open up its market for foreign investors after having been politically and economically isolated for decades. The free trade zones that China continuously establishes today are defined as general economic regions, which aim at attracting local as well as international companies by offering them incentives to incorporate their companies within the zone. These incentives can be of financial kind, uh, expressed in terms of customs and tax exemptions, or a high flexibility in currency trading, but they also mean simplified registration processes. Now, the first pilot free trade, free, uh, first pilot free trade zone was established in Shanghai in October 2013, and on the following slide, I'll look at the details of how that zone developed into the new zones that are being created today. A little more than one year later, at the beginning of 2015, the government confirmed the establishment of three additional zones in Tianjin, Guangdong, and Fujian. And in late August 2016, it was confirmed that seven more zones would be established in the inner part, the inside territory of China. So not on the coastal cities, being Zhenjiang, Hubei, Henan, Sichuan, Shanxi, and Liaoning, as well as Chongqing. Now, with the four existing free trade zones, they all strive to increase China's import and export, um, and there are significant differences in their attempts to achieve the overall goal. Each one is being run by its own uh, government office, uh, a promotions bureau uh, within that zone. So each of them has, an, has its own way of functioning, its own processes of functioning, and there are slight differences that one has to be aware of. Now, ultimately, when one is looking at these free trade zones, one can look at what the legislation says in terms of its benefits, its advantages, its disadvantages for you as a company going into, there, into the zone. But one important aspect that many of our, my clients forget to do is looking at the practicality, the operational efficiency of being located in a free trade zone. And both need to come hand in hand when deciding where you actually want to locate your company and register your company. Now, the original Shanghai Pilot Free Trade Zone was created on 17th of August 2013. It was opened on the 29th of September 2013. And it is the original pilot free trade zone. It was the first one to be established. It was the test run for the government to see how well it was going to proceed. And allow me to give a bit of details about it. So the, the national strategy for these pilot free trade zones was in terms of global competition, making sure that China remained as the number one target for investment. The internal needs, the government wanted to transform itself from a bureaucratic state to a market-oriented state. The renminbi internationalization, this has been in the media constantly, basically the renminbi internationalization became um, implemented or was properly uh, done within the free trade zone by allowing all banks to register their companies, to register their branches in the zone and allow for renminbi convertibility. And more than anything else, it was the testing ground. And it was a testing ground for two to three years. Now, the zone started off by being very small at around 28 square kilometers. And due to its success, within about a year, year and a half, the government expanded the zone area to an area of 120 square kilometers, taking up four different parks and zones and making it into one free trade zone. Now, there was a lot of discussion about the reform analysis. What was the purpose of these free trade zones? And initially, um, they had focused on four areas. One was the administrative system, what was to be improved, tax benefits, what needed to be improved, financial management, trade management, 
the shipping industry, and the logistics industry. Now, looking at the administrative system, we are looking at the pre-establishment national treatment, where basically foreign investors previously needed to meet certain thresholds in order to establish their companies within China. Now, all of a sudden, in the Shanghai Free Trade Zone and in the pilot free trade zones, foreign companies were treated identical to domestic companies in terms of registered capital, in terms of all the various um, uh, key considerations needed to actually establish a company. Foreign investors, identical to domestic companies. They then focus on the negative list, and I had mentioned this in yesterday's webinar, where basically they created the final 2015 catalog of restricted and prohibited uh, industries. And it's now called the negative list. And the negative list of 2015 is the network-wide list used to understand what companies, what foreign investors are allowed to invest 100% into China and others uh, prohibited or restricted. Now in 2013, when the Shanghai Pilot Free Trade Zone opened, this negative list was pertinent because it was the filtering system and the testing system of this negative list to say who could come in and who still had to stay out. The final was the simplified approval procedures, basically switching, from, uh, uh, switching to the record filing system. Now, all three of these administrative um, benefits that were created in 2013, they don't exist anymore. And actually, I highlighted it in yesterday's webinar. Today, foreign investors, whether they are going into the zone or outside of the zone, you can be considered as a domestic company. You will have the same treatment in terms of registered capital, in terms of all the other key considerations. The processes might be slightly different in terms of establishing a company, but in terms of key considerations, they're identical. Looking at the negative list, the negative list is now not just for free trade zones. It is a nationwide list that is used, whether you want to set up in the Shanghai downtown or in the Shanghai pilot free trade zone. Simplified approval procedures. Well, as I mentioned, as of October 1st, 2016, Simplified approval procedures are now nationwide. So the administrative benefits that were issued in 2013 are no longer benefits when considering whether to go into a zone or being outside of a zone. What you should focus on really are the tax benefits. Now the first are deferred taxes. The following income taxes uh, can be paid in installments over five years. One is uh, profits tax triggered by overseas investments or asset restructurings through non-monetary assets. Or two, individual income tax triggered by asset restructuring through non-monetary uh, assets as well. Export tax refund. Export taxes will be refunded for goods that financial leasing companies or, or their subsidiaries lease to overseas customers through financial leasing. Import tax policies are the same as those applicable to other free trade zones or other um, economic zones in that when you are importing goods into the zone, uh, you don't have to pay any type of customs duty. The goods enter free of charge. It's only when they are sold on consignment basis into domestic China, i.e. outside of these zones, that the customs duty is required to be paid. Products that are processed and produced by companies in the Shanghai Free Trade Zone using bonded materials that are resold to domestic consumers outside the Shanghai Free Trade Zone are still subject to customs duty, import VAT, and or consumption tax. So is, there is that differentiation. You then look, and, and these taxes are still uh, benefits if you locate within the zone. These tax benefits don't exist if you are not located within a zone. So from my perspective, the free trade zones, their true benefit is really associated with the tax benefits. Financial management. Uh, the first is financial deregulation. Firms in the zones 
are able to freely convert capital account RMB um, while interest rates and exchange rates are liberalized. You're allowed to do financial services, so companies that are banks, commodity futures trading, Sino foreign banks, financial leasing companies, um, these are all companies that are now permitted to establish themselves in the free trade zone. You have trade management companies that are also now established in the zone in terms of uh, brokerage agencies, credit investigating companies, uh, educational training institutions, all of these types of companies don't require a, a Chinese partner. You can invest 100% as a foreign investor. The shipping industry has eliminated equity restrictions for foreign capital in the vessel transportation sector. And wholly foreign-owned international vessel management companies are also permitted within the zones. Within the logistics sector, and this is for me a huge benefit or benefits that exist, and we'll highlight then the actual sectors that this implies to. Uh, logistics companies registered inside the free trade zone may now have majority shares. So you still need to be a joint venture, but you are can have majority shares uh, by locating in the zone. Uh, the goods can be consolidated within these zones for export um, to other ports. Foreign ships will now be allowed to ship from the zone to other domestic ports. What is extremely important is the border clearance, which has um, been loosened up tremendously. And I will go into details about the customs uh, and border clearance situation. Um, basically, uh, how this impacts the logistics sector is that goods, particularly fresh foods, or any goods that have uh, quick expiry dates uh, don't have to wait weeks on end to be inspected. It will be done so immediately and will be in a temperature controlled warehouse until they are inspected. So big differences compared to before. Um, and as a trading hub, these zones are an advantage in relation to paying customs duty, um, uh, particularly for as fulfillment centers for the e-commerce sector, um, there is huge advantages in relation uh, to that. Now, what sectors are encouraged in the four zones that are existing today? The Chinese government is in favor of 12 main industries. One is banking and financial services, as mentioned, shipping and logistics companies, telecommunication service providers, companies in the medical and the health sector, professional instructors, insurance companies, advertising and recruitment agencies, legal advice bureaus, video game console producers, machinery manufacturers, as well as travel agencies. A broad range of variety of sectors are being attracted into these zones. Now, the Shanghai Free Trade Zone, being that it was the first that was created, is targeting, in general, all of these sectors, all of these 12 main industries. The three other zones that are already established have a more filtered approach in terms of who they want to attract. In Tianjin, they're primarily trying to attract service companies within the trading sector, finance or logistics sector, as well as high-end manufacturing companies that are involved in aerospace, IT, R&D, and design. Fujian, being that it's right along the Maritime Silk Road, is really focused on new business models and new sectors, particularly following the One Belt, One Road initiative. Guangdong is focusing on the IT, the high-tech, the transportation and logistics, finance, tourism, and cultural sectors. Now, the other seven other zones that are being created and implemented right now, as mentioned previously, they're all inner cities. They're not on the coast. And the reason for that is the One Belt, One Road initiative. The Chinese government is trying to promote investment in the northeast 
the West and the center of China in order to promote this initiative that is coming about. Now, what are the key advantages for foreign investors? So I focused already on logistics companies not requiring to be uh, or where logistic foreign investors can hold majority ownership. You're looking at the transfer of cargo by shipping companies is now allowed. Foreign ships are allowed to ship from the zone to other domestic ports. But another big advantage is cash pooling cap capabilities. In comparison to Chinese regulations, the free trade zones also offer these advantageous rules in, in regards to cross-border cash flows in renminbi. Cash pooling was first allowed in 2014. It opened ways for domestic as well as foreign investors to bring renminbi into mainland China and to take renminbi from mainland China. And centralizing all the cash balances and cash flows within the zone, obviously leading to cost savings for relatively large multinational companies. Customs has also been simplified, and I have a specific slide associated with customs that I will go into more detail in relation to that. Cross-border legal services, this was a pilot scheme that was established in December 2014 and has become very successful which allows both domestic and foreign law firms operating in the zone to provide cross-border legal, legal uh, advice services. It's the, the boldest liberalization that has occurred in the legal services sector. And basically, it means that foreign law firms, if they establish within the free trade zones, are able to provide um, or are able to, to uh, uh, create some type of joint venture with foreign law firms to provide services both inbound and for outbound expansions. The next big advantage is the international trading hub and e-commerce. And honestly, for me, this is probably the biggest advantage that the free trade zones are offering to companies today. It's acting as an international hub for trading opportunities for products coming into China, products leaving China. But it really is acting as a fulfillment center for a lot of the e-commerce companies that are coming into China today. Why is that? Well, primarily because of the customs advantages that exist, and I will go on to that on the next slide. But the key point here to note is that since January 13th, 2015, any company that is engaging in e-commerce services is allowed to invest in the Chinese market 100%. No joint venture partner is required. And that's really one of uh, the booming sectors that is occurring in all the free trade zones today. Now, why is that? Well, the big advantage of the free trade zones is the customs clearance. So to expedite, the import and export of goods for entities within the zone, the Shanghai Customs, as well as all the other free trade zones, all the other cities, customs bureaus, have implemented these three rules to ease the customs process. The first is declaration after goods entry mode, which basically means that you don't have to declare goods the minute it arrives in the zone you have 14 days to process the declaration after the goods have been imported, allowing you to consolidate and do collective declarations. So basically, because you can do a declaration after goods have arrived, it allows you, if you have many shipments coming in, to then do a collective declaration for batches of goods that are being transported within the zone. And as a consequence that these, this collective declaration can occur, you can do a centralized tax payment where you pay customs duty or you pay off um, these one-time fees uh, to the tax bureaus uh, in a lump sum based on the imported goods. So all of this allows a much more fluid motion and ease of operation for a company when importing the goods. Now, the biggest issue, though, 
and this has really taken place as of July 2016, and it's taken effect from October 1st, 2016, is the fact that the Chinese government or the, or the customs bureaus are boosting the amount of China customs audits. It is expected to lead to increased efforts to complete audits of all importers, exporters, and processing trade manufacturers. Businesses are advised to review their operations and activities to assure they will not be subject to any scrutiny. Now, this is all extremely important because the Chinese customs authorities are seeing that if you are prolonging your declarations of goods entering into China, you might even forget to do certain declarations or pay certain taxes. And as a consequence to, to that, they have increased their resources, they've increased their manpower, and they are going to be doing customs audits to see that when you are importing or exporting products, you are have the right processes internally within your companies to be able to do that. Now, moving along in terms of the disadvantages that are existing in the zones, one has to focus on the tax implications for e-commerce businesses, which also has been updated as of April 8, 2016. Now, you know, as mentioned, the advantage of the zone, really from my perspective, is that you can act, use it as an international trading hub and as an e-commerce fulfillment center. However, since March 2016, a circular on the taxation policy on cross-border e-commerce retail importation, also known as Circular 18, has come into force. And the two major implications introduced are new types of taxes, which are to be levied on goods imported under the cross-border e-commerce program, and the regime changes from a previous negative list to a positive list of goods permissible under the program. And basically it stems from the fact that while the importation of personal articles used for personal consumption by postal and courier services or carry-on luggage under the program, um, there is now this personal and parcel article tax which is being charged. Now what was happening within the e-commerce sector was that you would have com e-commerce companies import goods through these free trade zones, but that would actually be sent to individuals, would not be sent to companies. Now because of this, you're sending these individual parcels, not by freight, but actually by FedEx, TNT, DHL, and generally, when it goes through customs, it's a very fast procedure and no customs duty is declared or paid, particularly for those articles where the value is extremely high. Now, a key point here is that the government is saying, if you are now sending parcels to individuals, a tax needs to be declared and paid. Otherwise, we're not earning any of anything off of these cross-border transactions. So as a consequence, Circular 18 is introducing um, new import taxes, um, and it's, it's customs duty, it's value-added tax, as well as consumption tax, depending on the product that is being imported. And, and these are all very important facts that need to be taken into consideration now when you are doing e-commerce. You know, at some point, it might be better for you to actually establish a company within the free trade zone, import in bulk, and create your own fulfillment center. Obviously, there are many other considerations that need to be taken uh, in, in, into mind, um, especially if you're looking at the, the volume and values of goods that are being imported. Uh, but it is important to, to, to make that calculation and understand where it's okay to still act from abroad by importing directly to individual customers um, and where it does make sense to actually establish your company and import as bulk. Now, the last point regarding these free trade zones is looking at how it compares to Hong Kong because I get this question a lot. Does it make sense for me to establish my, my, my company in Hong Kong or does it make sense for me to establish in the free trade zones? Are the zones 
competing against Hong Kong or are they allies? Now, according to experts, the setup of the free trade areas in China is an important measure to attract and lure foreign investors to the Chinese market. But this is a very broad uh, goal and objective by the Chinese government. What foreign investors are they trying to attract? And as you can see from the list of the key sectors, you're really looking at manufacturing companies or companies that are actually trading. If you're looking at medical device companies, e-commerce companies, logistics companies, manufacturing companies, all of these companies are ultimately trading in product. Now for me, this is a big uh, differential because I believe the free trade zones, if you are trading in product, they offer an advantage. If you are, however, providing services, then Hong Kong might be a better stepping stone for you. Or ultimately, not setting up your service company in the free trade zone, but actually setting up your service company in downtown Shanghai or outside of these zones. Now, in order to then understand whether Hong Kong and these outside zone areas are, are advantage, you would have to make a comparison for yourself, for your business model, for your market, whether Hong Kong is more advantageous or mainland China outside of the zones uh, is more advantageous. Now, I always find that a big uh, impact or a big decision-making factor for many foreign investors, uh, whether they decide on Hong Kong or whether they decide on the free trade zone, is really dependent on the law system, the legal system. To establish a company in Hong Kong versus establishing company in China, nowadays it's very much comparable in terms of time frames, um, although uh, uh, it is slightly longer in, in, in China compared to Hong Kong. The biggest disadvantage with Hong Kong is you have problems with bank account openings. In China, you have less of this issue. But the legal system of actually operating your company, maintaining your company, following the common law system in Hong Kong versus the Chinese legal system, Hong Kong provides a much fairer playing field for many foreign investors. It also simplifies in their mind uh, how to establish and operate a company. It gives them confidence more so in Hong Kong than it does in China. In addition to all of that comes the fact that Hong Kong's tax system is naturally much lower than China. You're looking at 16% in Hong Kong versus 25% in China. Now, I did touch on the tax issue previously in terms of what advantages exist. You're looking at deferred taxes. You're looking at um, import duty taxes. This is all still extremely beneficial. But when you look at profits tax, which is a key component when you start becoming profitable in the Chinese market, you are going to find that Hong Kong has a 16% tax rate versus China, which has a 25% tax rate. And this can also lead to a major decision factor for companies. Now, there's been rumors going about that these free trade zones would eventually lower their tax rates. I don't see that happening. I don't hear the rumors. I don't believe that the free trade zones will lower their tax rates. So do take that in mind that there is this differential. Now, one also has to consider all the practicalities surrounding these free trade zones. The first is distance. Most of these free trade zones that are along the coastal cities of Shanghai or in Fujian or in Guangdong, they are not in downtown areas. They are really on the outskirts, the suburbs of the downtown areas. If you take the Shanghai Free Trade Zone as an example, you're looking at a commute one way of approximately one to one and a half hours depending on traffic. So if you are, let's say, in the service sector and you have seen that there's been an opening up of your industry within the free trade zones, Usually, service companies are located in the downtown areas, not in the outskirts or suburbs of 
uh, these major city centers. So it's important to look at that practicality. Finding employees. How easy is it, particularly in the service sector, how easy is it going to be to find uh, individuals that are willing to commute for one hour to one and a half hours on a daily basis to go to these zones? So from a, from a superficial point of view, you are looking at the legislation, are you permitted? What, what, what ease of business is being given to you by locating in the free trade zones? What benefits will be applied to you? Don't forget when looking at the legislations, what disadvantages may be given to you? People always focus on the benefits but never focus on the disadvantages when they're looking at the legislations. And then focusing on the practicalities. One is distance. One is finding employees. Even if you are in the trading sector, trying to find senior management positions or roles that are willing to travel and communicate, uh, commute these long distances are not going to be easy. And from our uh, point of view, the trend has been that most companies will set up um, small facilities in these free trade zones just to be established there in order to benefit from customs. I mean, they'll have the goods flowing through, but they'll outsource most of the logistics because the logistics companies are establishing themselves there. So if you look at these international trading hub, trading companies, or these e-commerce companies, they're outsourcing their logistics. They're not doing it in-house. Most of the fulfillment centers, if they're very large, will be done in-house, but if they're small initially, you're gonna outsource it. You're not gonna create it on your own. And then they will open up small branch companies or, or actually the larger operational branches in the downtown areas in order to be able to make the management happy and find good quality people that are willing to work in the downtown areas. Tax rates, big issue that you need to look at. Profits tax rates. There are no benefits that are existing. Key points I want you all to also consider are the administrative measures. They're, the promotion bureaus in these free trade zones are really vocalizing themselves about the lower time frame in establishing a company in terms of the approval processes are being much more simplified, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But this is everywhere in China now, as I highlighted in yesterday's webinar. So it's very important to look at all aspects when going into the Chinese market, going into these free trade zones. I have companies coming to me who are saying, we want to be located in the free trade zone because we have heard that in our sector we will get these advantages. Yes, but we be weary of also the disadvantages that this might bring you. And you've got to make, and I, and I really want to emphasize this to all companies, because deciding on whether you'll be in a free trade zone, deciding whether you'll be outside of mainland China, this all impacts an important component of setting up your company, which is your registered office address. You need to know where you're going to incorporate your company. You need to know what advantages that's going to bring for the long term, so that really you don't change that address because as I highlighted yesterday, you might have issues with your tax bureaus in that when you change from one district tax bureau to another, a tax audit is required and it may halt your business in terms of being able to issue invoices to your customers if you're selling on the market. If you think today Shanghai Free Trade Zone is a better location than the Free Trade Zone in Fujian province or in Guangdong province, you're going to have to set up a new entity because it's different municipalities, different government bodies located within those zones. You cannot just uh, bring your entity from one location, one city, to another city. So really look at the advantages that these zones offer and really look at the disadvantages that they offer as well. A recommendation that I always make to my clients is travel to the zone, physically see it, meet with the promotions bureau, see what they are going to say and make sure you have a list of questions readily available to counter them in case you want, uh, uh, in, in order for you to get a full picture of whether the free trade zone offers you advantages or does not offer you advantages.
Now for me, when I, to, to really sum up what key industries would be beneficial in the zone, one would be international uh, trading companies that are really doing extensive imports and exports. So setting up in the free trade zone, not only to sell into the domestic Chinese market, but also to sell to other Asian countries and having a, a get, like I said, a fulfillment center in the zone to then bring product to the other Asian countries um, in a just-in-time uh, requirement. Looking at e-commerce companies, big advantage there in terms of uh, very similar to the concept of the international trading hubs. Looking at manufacturing companies, manufacturing companies that have been thus far restricted to produce their products because of the negative list. Perhaps they will be able to manufacture in these free trade zones. Now, I'm not a real estate agent, but another key point to calculate is whether the rental prices for properties, for commercial property or even workshops, is cheaper or not in the zone compared to outside of the zone. I hear completely differing points of view on this, but it is also something to investigate, and which is why I tell people, visit the zone. Visit also logistics companies that are located. See the facilities that they are offering. Make sure that you want to work with these partners and the warehousing facilities that they are, that they are showing. If you want, you can also contact the Promotions Bureau to meet with one of the customs officers so you can understand in greater detail how the customs system is working. And in this webinar series, we will have a webinar based purely on customs, importing goods, exporting goods, and the challenges that exist around that. And we have a speaker who was previously an employee with the customs bureaus who will be providing us with insight. So please, if you are interested in that topic, do join us for that webinar. Looking at the customs audits, how is it going to affect you? Yes, more resources are being developed, but is the Chinese government going to focus on smaller companies or the multinationals, larger companies that have a greater volume of transactions going in and out of China? Tax implications for e-commerce companies, tax implications in general should always be analyzed. There are a lot of issues to consider. And I hope today I was able to touch on just a few of them. Now, I've noticed that no questions have come in uh, during this webinar presentation. So if you do have questions, please don't hesitate to contact me, and I would be happy to provide you with more advice on the zones and how it may impact you on an individual basis for your company. If you enjoyed today's webinar, then I do encourage you to participate and register for our upcoming eight webinar sessions. If you are interested specifically in hearing about the customs uh, regulations, that will occur on March 27th uh, with the webinar entitled Brace for Impact, Challenges in Importing and Exporting in China. And our speaker is a, a former uh, uh, customs officer, and he will pro be providing us with insight on that. So I do encourage you to participate in that webinar. As mentioned early on, if you are interested in subscribing to our monthly resources, webinars, or other information that is all complimentary, then do subscribe to our e-newsletter, uh, which can be done on our homepage by simply inserting your email address. I want to thank you all for joining us today, and I look forward to seeing you all again very soon. Thank you, and goodbye. <laughs>